It's that time of year. Now I know on Sunday mornings we've been talking about, you know, um, come and dine has been our series. And, and then what Jesus taught when he was sitting down and eating. And t- today is going to be no different. We're still going to do that. But uh, I, I do want to talk to you about a couple things. I mean, uh, it, it is, you know, it's July. And July is usually what we call our Joe Ash month. Joe Ash is, is what we use. Um, we, we have a Joe Ash loan and all this other stuff that we use for, to, to get property and building improvements. We have a duplex next door now, all these kind of things. We'll be talking about that very, very soon, um, sp- specifically more next week. But I want you to go ahead and pray this month and say, God, what would you have me do to be a part of that? Um, and that's all I'm going to say this week because I didn't really announce that or, or say anything earlier, but that, that is what I'm going to say this week. But be praying about that and praying what God can do. Now, the other thing I want you to do is, like I said, we do have some property that's on Colburn Road. We do have it listed now, if you don't know. Pray that God would help us sell that property. Uh, and that's what I want everybody to do. And pray that God would help us uh, to sell that property uh, and uh, to, to alleviate what we have there with our Joe Ash as well. And so I think if we all start praying together, God's going to do something great. Um, I'll just tell you that right off the bat. So that's, like I said, that's what I'm going to say about that. We'll talk a little bit more about Joash. If you notice, like our house isn't in the back. It, it started to come apart on us. Uh, so we took it down. We're, you'll see um, it'll be digital now, digital age, right? Uh, so you'll see like a digital graph and everything for that, uh, for where we're at. And, but we'll talk more about that in, in the following weeks. But uh, like I said, this is that time of year. You know, it, it's summertime. Now, I will tell you, uh, Friday, I went into the store because I was talking to one of our children's church workers, and uh, she's like, oh, hey, we need to get a craft for the kids. We're supposed to do a craft for Sunday. Can we find like a 4th of July themed craft? You know, something that the kids can do like that. Then it has to do with the holiday. I said, great, I'll go. Everything will be on sale. It's July 5th. I walked in to the first store that I walked into. I walked in there and I said, hey, where's your, like, your, your leftover 4th of July stuff? Well, it's over here. And I, I went to that section and there really wasn't much left. There's decorations and stuff. But what really got me is that I had to walk past their brand new section that they had set up. And you think, I know, it's July and they got back to school stuff already. Nope. I walked past their Halloween section. I'm like, I'm not kidding. They were setting stuff out. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, we're still supposed to be having picnics and going to the park, right? It's, it's like, this is, I mean, summer started on June 21st. Summer started on June 21st. How old is summer now? Three weeks, right? It's three weeks old. Summer's three weeks old. I was just like, you know, you got to be kidding me. I thought that was crazy. But that's the, that's the season we're in, right? How many of you have been on a picnic yet this year? Really, not a single hand. Is that like some? Oh, I saw one hand. Got one hand. A couple. Okay, there's a couple hands. You know. You know. Now I will tell you, if you sit in your car, maybe you, you drive around for work and you eat your lunch at a park in the parking lot. That counts. <laughs> all right. No. <laughs> now I see more hands going up. Uh, all right. No. But you know, does everybody remember the good old-fashioned picnic going out and you, you set out a little blanket on the ground or whatever? Or maybe there's a picnic table. You can use a picnic table too. You know. But you get out there. You're at the park and. And maybe you use their grills and you cook some cheeseburgers or maybe you just brought sandwiches with you, but you laid it all out and you just sat down and you just kind of had a, a, a lunch, right? Or a dinner or whatever it was. You just had a picnic lunch or a picnic dinner. Picnics are just enjoyable, aren't they? They're just a wonderful time to sit down and, and, and to have, you know, just a time together and, and you, you eat and you fellowship and it's just great. Well, I want to talk to you guys today about the greatest picnic ever. The greatest picnic that ever happened. Does anybody know what that is? The feeding of the 5,000. The feeding of the 5,000. It was a picnic, but it wasn't even a planned picnic, if you will. I mean, it just people just came, right? And that's what happened. And we're going to be, so I want you to, look, to turn to the book of Mark chapter 6, if you will. Mark chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you this. There are only two things that happened in the ministry of Jesus Christ, in the life of Jesus Christ, that all four Gospels recorded. That all four Gospels recorded in detail. These are those two things. Number one, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is recorded in all four Gospels. The second thing is the feeding of the 5,000. 
That's the only other event that all four Gospels recorded, all right? Even the birth of Jesus Christ, you know, you go through there and you say, well, I mean, Luke had it, you know, and this, well, John didn't really talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, right? He said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, right? And, and he went in there because he was trying to establish that Jesus Christ was God. All right, And so not even the birth of Jesus Christ was recorded, specifically recorded in detail in all four Gospels. Yet this event, the feeding of the 5,000, this event that happened, and it just kind of came together, um, was so, uh, it had such an impact on the writers and the disciples, because you know that one of the writers of the Gospels was Luke. So he got this from his interviews. So he talked to the disciples, and they told him what happened. And he thought it important enough to put it down, to record it. Now, remember, we know that the, you know, the, the writer of the, of the Gospels, they said, hey, all, if we tried to write down everything that Jesus did, there wouldn't be a book big enough to contain it. They are like, it would, just, it, would, it would be bigger than war and peace, Okay. And uh, thank you for some of you guys getting that one. Um, but, uh, you know, they were, they were like, you know, all, but all four of them, this one impacted all of them enough to say, we're going to write this down. We're going to record this. Now, I want to give you a little bit of setup of what's going on here, because a lot of times we just kind of jump in and we say, oh, Jesus was teaching and people were there and then it was time to eat. And that's kind of what happened. Here's the lead up to this. Jesus got his disciples together and sent them out into the cities two by two. He sent them on their very first missionary trip, if you will. All right? And he said, I want you to go out into these cities. I'm going to give you power to cast out devils. I'm going to give you power to do miracles in my name. That's what he told them he was going to do. And he's like, while you guys are out there, and I want you to go out, I want you to preach, and I want you to teach that I am coming. And prepare these areas for my coming. And that's what Jesus did with these disciples. And so then they came back to him. And when they came back, yeah, Jesus was doing some more teaching and some more, you know, preaching and this and that. Well, then Jesus gets to his disciples and he says, you know what, guys, let's, let's retreat up into the mountain. And we're going to have retreat because I want you guys to be able to, to decompress a little bit. And we're going to talk about what's going on. And we're going to have some time together. And what you guys did, what you guys experienced. I, that, that's kind of like where it kind of seems like it. Because Jesus takes his disciples up into this mountain intently. And they got on a ship. And they sailed to where it was at. Okay? So they got on a boat. They followed. Now here's the deal. Jesus' popularity was getting so big at this time that people saw him leaving. And you know what they did? They followed him. And not necessarily in ships. It says that they ran. People ran on, uh, you know, along, on, the, on the ground, all right, on land, and they ran around to where Jesus was going, and they met him there. Some of them, it says they even ran ahead of him. They knew where he was probably headed, and so they beat him there because they heard that he was there. That's the popularity that Jesus had. And so then when Jesus gets up there in the mountain, he was going to get with this little retreat with his disciples and have some private time. Didn't quite work out that way. Next thing you know, the crowd begins to gather and more and more and more people come. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus does what he always did. He taught. That's what he did. But I want us to start here in the book of Mark. We're going to look now, like I said, this is recorded in all four gospels. We're going to stick to two. We're going to be in the book of Mark. We're going to be in the book of John for this one, even though it's recorded in all in the other two. In Matthew and Luke, we're going to stay in Mark and John here. And if you want to, you can, you can go ahead and turn to John chapter 6, because that's where we're at. John chapter 6 is also where we're going to be, and you can stick your finger in there. All right? But beginning here, Mark chapter 6, beginning of verse 30, says, And the apostles gathered, gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. They're giving him a report. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They were busy. Things were going on. So Jesus said, Let's go have a retreat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. That's the picture. Jesus was trying to decompress with his disciples. They were giving him reports of where they were at, what they were doing, the things that they had been able to teach, the things that they had been able to see and do. And Jesus said, you know what? Let's go somewhere private. We're going to sit down. We're going to have like just a little time together. You guys tell me all this and we're going to focus on this. But the problem was when they left, people followed. 
right? Now I want you to look at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were his sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you, Lord. We just thank you again, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you for what it means. We thank you for what it says. And God, we thank you that it is breathed by you, that you gave us your word, and it is the truth that we can, that we can steer our lives by. God, I pray now that our hearts would be open to your word and it would touch us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's, here's the, the picture. Jesus was trying to get some alone time with his disciples. The people wouldn't let him have it. But when they got there to this mountain, the pe there was people already there. There's people that began to gather and they had just a crowd. Now, we know that they numbered the men and it was the men that numbered 5,000. So it was, it was a crowd much larger than that. But Jesus looked out upon this crowd, it says in verse 34, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Did Jesus get upset about his plans being messed up? Did Jesus get irritated that what he wanted to happen wasn't going to happen? No, Jesus' heart was always for people, wasn't it? They didn't even have a chance to eat, it said in the verses previous to that. They were hungry. They were tired. Let's go sail over here. I don't know how long it took them to sail, but they sailed. It probably wasn't super far because people could outrun them on their feet. That's true. And so they sailed over to where they, then they got off the boat and they start, and then Jesus sees the people coming and he gets up into the mountain and more and more and more people came. And he says, he saw them and was moved with compassion because they were what? Like sheep without a shepherd. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is the, the good shepherd, isn't he? How can the good shepherd be okay with just shooing off some sheep? Ah, oh, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. I had plans. I had what I wanted to do, and now it's not going to happen. No, that's not what Jesus Christ did. So what happens because of this? It says there that he began to teach them many things. So Jesus, hungry, probably a little bit tired, wanted to have some time with his disciples, he begins to teach. And he taught and he taught and he taught. And the crowd listened and listened and listened. And that's where we're at. That's what happens. And like I said, we know what happened with the feeding of the 5,000. You know, Jesus, you know, broke five loaves and two fishes. And this great miracle happened. And we look at that and we think, oh, this is a wonderful miracle. This is all this stuff. But do you realize that not only was this a teaching time for the crowd, but this was a teaching time for Jesus' disciples. Jesus Christ used this whole entire instance, this whole, you know, uh, 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 experience here, if you will, to teach his disciples what they need to do and what they need to focus on and, and how they need to view things. Because it would have been very easy for Jesus to say, you know what? No, I gave you guys time when I was in the city. I taught you. Now I want it to be my time with my disciples. That was his intent. And there was nothing wrong with his intent. All right, right? That was his intent. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to go up there and they, he wanted to teach his disciples. I think it's really good that you have that time with maybe other pastors, teachers, leaders, and you spend time together and you talk and you learn. I think that's great. But Jesus, not only did, you know, did he have that desire to do that, but then all of a sudden people showed up and he looked and he says, the need outweighs what I want. The need outweighs what my original intentions were. And he said, these people need to be taught. So Jesus committed himself to teaching this multitude of people. And not just this multitude of people, but his disciples too. So what does it mean to us? We, we think about this. We hear about it. We talk about it all the time. All right? The feeding of the 5,000. But I want you to think of, of what it means for us. What does Jesus want us to learn from this miracle? That he can do whatever he wants to do? We know that. We, we've learned that since we were a child. Jesus took that and, and, and they passed it out to everybody and everybody got full. There were leftovers. How was there leftovers with five loaves, two fishes, and over 5,000 people? All right? Well, I was in Sunday school class this morning and I had a couple Sunday school teachers gone. So I said, we'll just all, we'll combine all three classes downstairs. So all the three classes that meet downstairs, we were all together in one room. There was breakfast pizza, there was breakfast casserole, there was some kind of giant breakfast cake thing, there was fruit back there, there was all kinds of stuff. At the end of the day, there wasn't much left. 
All right? I was surprised. I was like, I don't think I've ever seen that much food piled up on that table back there. And they tore it up. They tore it up. Now, there was leftovers, but there wasn't much. But I remember looking back there and thinking, there's a lot of food. That's not where my mind would have went if I was up on this mountainside and they brought Jesus five loaves and two fishes. That's not a lot of food. That's like food for one person. And that's not even a lot of food, is it? Because, I mean, let's, let's be honest. If you were Jewish, you, your loaf of bread wasn't sourdough. Your, your bread didn't have leaven in it. It was flat. It was more like a pita that you could kind of roll up, right? It, it was. Honestly, it was. It was a little flat piece of bread that you could use, and that's what it was. So you could probably wrap like one of those small fishes, and those small fishes were probably like a sardine. So it's not like it was a huge fish. And I mean, let's just, let's just be honest. I ain't getting in line for a sardine, okay? I'm going to go over to the pasta section or something like that, okay? Not the sardine section. But uh, that's what they had, so that's what, that's what, you know, what was there at their, you know, at their availability, if you will. And you look at that and you think, okay, well, you know, that, I'm not going to think that's going to feed 5,000. Definitely not. I thought we were going to have a whole lot more leftover food this morning than when we had, but I was wrong. There's a bunch of young guys in class, and there wasn't, right? Because young guys know how to eat. But here's the, that's the situation, right? There's this large crowd of people, and they begin to get hungry. I want you to, to turn to the book of John, chapter 6. And I'll keep your finger in Mark, chapter 6. But go to John, chapter 6. And I want you to look in the, in the book of John, chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 5. And verse 6, because the first thing we see here, like remember, this is what does it mean to us. Jesus desires us to see the need. Jesus desired us, desires us to see the need. Look at what it says in verse 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? What was Jesus' question? He turned to one of his disciples and he said, what? Hey, where can we get some bread at so that these people can eat? <laughs> okay. Right? It's not like, yeah, yeah, the 12 disciples, none of them were ultra wealthy. All right? I mean, Matthew was probably the wealthiest disciple of all of them, and that's because he grew up being a cheat. Right? He was dishonest, probably, in what he did before. He was a tax collector. You know, nobody liked him. Plus, he was despised because he worked for the Roman Empire. But Matthew probably had the most out of all of them. Hey, you know, I can see Matthew. Matthew's probably doing the numbers, and he's like, not going to happen. We ain't got that kind of money, that kind of money in the purse, right? Uh, he's like, not going to happen. So Jesus, the people are here. And Jesus, he turns to his disciple, Philip. He looks over at Philip and he goes, hey, where can we get some bread at so these people can eat? Philip probably went, <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> Jesus, you're on fire today. All right? Man, hey, wait, tell the other disciples this one. They're, they're going to find it. They're going to get a kick out of that one too, right? But look what it says in verse 6. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Now, we know that John wrote his book later on in his life. So John had a lot of time to think about it. John had a lot of time to reflect, re re reflect on it too, right? John knew exactly. When he looks back on this and he's remembering this story, he was like, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. So why then would Jesus look at Philip and say, where can we go buy bread at? Knowing that their bag of money was pathetically in, uh, enable or unable, if you will, to pay for getting enough bread to feed these people. Because Jesus wanted Philip and the rest of the disciples to look out and to see the need. What did it say when, it, there in Mark when the crowd came? Jesus looked at them and was moved with compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. Jesus saw the spiritual need in the hearts and lives of these people. And by the way, the, the, in the other Gospels, you'll see that the, their suggestion when the people came, if you look this up in, like, uh, in uh, Luke, uh, I think Matthew says it too, they wanted to send them home. They're like, hey, let them go home so they can go get some food, Lord, because uh, they need to get some food. They, nobody came up here prepared. Remember, they ran on ahead. It's not like people said, oh, I'm going to swing by the house. I'm going to get some snacks. I'm gonna get a, we're going to get a big old blanket so we can lay down. We'll grab the basket. We'll bring some plates. Don't forget the jello salad. 
right? That's not what happened. That's not what happened. People, they just left what they were doing and they followed Jesus up to this mountain. No one was prepared for what the need was. But Jesus tells his disciples, how are we going to take care of this need, guys? Where can we get bread at? What? The first thing he wanted them to see was the need. Christian, I'm here to tell you that there is a great need in the world today. That need is Jesus Christ. That need is for people not only to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, because for many people, that is the need. They need to know that there is a hell and they are headed there. But there's also a need for Christians to see that Jesus Christ needs to become the number one thing in their life. Number one. Nothing else should matter above Jesus Christ. And when we're in ministry, if you teach or, or, or maybe you preach or maybe you work with others, maybe you take somebody through discipleship, see the need. See the need. What is that need? That this person, that these people need to come closer to Jesus Christ. You know, every time we come into church, we ought to want to be drawn a little bit closer to Jesus Christ. Just a little bit. Say, I was here, now I'm a little bit closer. Sometimes maybe we can take big steps, sometimes it's little steps, but always move toward Jesus, never away. That's the need, isn't it? Everything we do ought to be pointing people towards Jesus Christ. When you maybe see a need in somebody's house, you say, well, man, well, this person, you know, they, don't, they had a surgery, they had this. Well, one of the things we love to do around here at our church, we make meals for people, don't we? You know why? Because we see needs. Oh, it'd be a whole lot easier to be able to make a meal for somebody and bring it to them. But why do we do that? Because food is the most important thing in their life? Absolutely not. We do that so we can show a little bit of Jesus Christ. We love you. Your church body loves you. We want to, this is just something we can do for you. We just want to be a blessing. And we want people to experience Jesus Christ, not to experience ourselves. Now, I'm not saying that some of y'all can cook and some of y'all can't cook. But you don't go there so people can pat you on the back and say, your lasagna was the best lasagna I had out of everybody else's lasagna. That's not why we do that. We do that so that people can see Jesus Christ. Why does the Sunday school teacher study out the lesson, prepare the lesson, and stand up there? And, you know, I mean, they'll go back and they'll cross reference this word and study that word and look up this word. And, I mean, they're going back there and they're, they're well, let me, let me look at every verse that has to do with this subject. I'm going to, and then they're going through all this. They put all that time into that. Why? What, so they can sound smart? I've never been accused of that ever. Okay, but I can tell you this, it's about seeing the need and that need is I need to show them Jesus Christ. That's what our need is. And Jesus Christ wanted the disciples to see the need. And they're like, yes, Jesus, we know there's a great need. Everybody's hungry and we can't feed them. Let me tell you something, no matter how talented, no matter how well-spoken you are, no matter how deep your pockets may go, it's not about what you are, what you have, or what you can be. It's about Jesus Christ. The need is Jesus, not ourselves, right? That's where we're at. That, that's what we have to understand. And that's what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to see here. So he looks at Philip and he's like, hey, where can we buy bread? Well, not to trick Philip or to, to have a laugh or to, to mess Philip up, but so Philip can say, this day going to happen. And Jesus says, see the need. See the need. Now, I know the need's bigger than you can do, but you've got to see the need. Folks, we look at, there may be somebody that comes in and say, how am I supposed to help that person? We point them to Jesus Christ. We let Jesus Christ do the work. We don't change hearts, do we? We don't change hearts. We don't work in hearts. We don't do any of that stuff. It's the word of God that does that. Amen. So what do we do? We impart the word of God. We teach it to them, give it to them, be a blessing to that person. But we can't do that unless we see the need. The second thing that he does is also in John chapter 6, so stay there for a minute. I want you to look at verse 7, 8, and 9. All right? Not only does Jesus desire us to see the need, but he desires us to see beyond our limitations. That's the obvious next step, right? When Philip was like, wait, uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Jesus knew. Look at verse 7. Philip answered him. At least Philip had the audacity or the courage, I guess I should say, or the mindfulness to speak back up. And Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. 
okay? And let me just, I'll just, you know, now I know that Pennyworth is different, but we'll just say this. Hey, uh, Jesus, I got bad news. We got two bucks. Okay. Now it's probably a little bit more than that, but you know, you think when I think pennies, I think, you know, oh, it's a hundred pennies and a dollar, right? We're about to have day camp. We do a coin march for the kids. They come up here and they dump it all out by weight. And on that last Sunday, it's all the kids together versus all of the adults, right? And who always wins? The kids always win. Now, if I was to go through and I was to count all that, that would probably be different, Right? Because the adults could, honestly, if you want to go on the actual amount that's in there, the adults could, could whoop them. You know, but the kids get all excited because it's like they're putting in quarters and nickels and dimes, and, right? What is, what is Andrew saying here? Well, God, we got a little bit. We ain't got that much. I mean, we're hard-pressed to feed 12 people. We were going to go, and I was going to have to haggle with the guy that makes the bread just to get 12 loaves. So we could have a little bit to put in our stomachs. He goes, there's no way we're going to be able to feed all these people. That's what he said. It's not sufficient. Have you ever seen that what we are is not sufficient? What we have is not sufficient. But what God has is always sufficient. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Now, I want you to think something. I want you to go back to the first thing. What was the first thing Jesus wanted them to do? See the need. They saw the need. They saw the need. Andrew was like, he knew how much money they had, which means he what? He went and found out. He, he went and he's like, hey, who's got the bag? How much we got in the bag? Okay. I'm going to go tell Jesus that's, that's not going to happen. Right? So he knew. Then... Uh, right? Then, then, then uh, Andrew, so Philip knew what was in the bag. He went to that. Then Andrew shows up and said, I've been asking around. They were actually going out and trying to solve the problem, weren't they? Give them credit because they saw the need and they said, we got to try to feed these people. We got to try to do this. And so then Andrew comes back with this boy and he's like, he's got five loaves and two fishes. But, uh, but what is that? Among so many. It's like they threw their hands up, didn't they? Let's, we tried. Jesus, we gave it the old college try. I never even understood what that was. The old college try. Because if you've been in college, you probably don't try real hard. Okay? I'm just saying. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, they went out there and they did the best that they could. They, they counted up every, every cent that they had. They, they went and they, you know, kidnapped some poor kid just for his lunch. Drug him to Jesus, right? No, I'm just kidding. They didn't kidnap him. The kid was willing to share. You have to give the child credit. And, but they're like, what are we supposed to do, Lord? This, this is totally and utterly and completely out of our hands. There's no way we're going to do this. Lord, let's, let's, let's re-examine what we want to do. Send everyone home. We can't feed them, right? But what does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to see beyond the limitations that we have. He, want us, he wants us to see beyond what we can and we can't do. Someone may sit there and say, you know what? I, no, I am no good when it comes to like trying to talk to somebody about the Lord. I'm here to tell you right now, that doesn't matter. I'm no good when it comes to trying to invite somebody to church or tell somebody about my testimony. That doesn't matter. If God is in it, it will go great. You say, how do you know that? Because it's God, not us. And God's promised that. God's promised that. He tells us that. I mean, he sent his 12 disciples out, and they hadn't been following him around real long. And then he sends them out without him. Could, what would you do if you were one of these guys? You know? But what did he do? Then he tells them, but I'm going to give you these power, the, the power to be able to cast out devils. I'm going to give you the power to be able to do these miracles. I'm going to, and I, I, you guys go. And then he tells them, by, by the way, what did he tell them to take? nothing except the clothes on their back and their staff. You take your walking stick and your clothing. Don't take money. Don't take food. Don't prepare for this. Go out there. And if people invite you into their house, they'll take care of you. Let them take care of you. If they don't, go to the next place and just keep teaching and keep preaching. He told them to go with nothing. They just got done doing this trip where God told them, Jesus told them, don't prepare. You know, don't, you know, I mean, not spiritually, he told them to prepare, 
But he was like, put yourself in my hands. Let me take care of you. Now, I'm not saying, you know, if you feel like God's calling you to be a missionary, just, you know, get on a plane, sneak onto a plane in the luggage compartment, fly to some place and let God take care of you. Okay, don't do that. Right? But what did Jesus, what was Jesus trying to teach them with this trip? To trust him. To trust him. And right now, then they came back, they began telling him all these things that they saw, all these things that they were able to do, all these blessings that they were able to experience. And Jesus is sitting there talking to them. And now he's got this big multitude of people that they're trying to feed. And they're like, we can't do this. Jesus is like, right. It's in my hands. It's not in your guys' hands. And that leads us to the next part. I want you to go back to Mark, Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, look down in verse 38. And we're going to read verse 38 all the way through verse 42. And it says, And he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five loaves and two fishes. Again, same story. Right? Same thing. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties. He grouped them out. Have them sit down in fifties. Have them sit down in hundreds. Like, Jesus just starts giving orders. He just starts telling them what to do. What do we got? Okay, go tell everybody to sit down. What? Like we're going to eat? What? A, how? Okay. So that's what the disciples did. Oh, well, I don't, I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but we're going to go do it. Verse 41, and when he had taken the, the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. He divided among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. What was Jesus trying to do? Show his disciples his authority. If God wants a miracle to happen, it will happen. If God is in it, who can be against it? If what we are doing in this church is for God and in the name of God, then who can stop us? Because we don't do it in our power. We don't teach in our power. We don't preach in our power. We don't minister in our power. We don't go out and do our bus routes, our van routes in our power. We don't do the nursery in our power, our children's ministries in our power. Nothing we do in this church should be in our power. It should be in the power of Jesus Christ. Nothing we do in this church is by our authority. It's by the authority of God. That means that what we preach, what we teach, everything that we do should be by the authority of God and his word. That means we can't preach or teach anything that goes against God's word. That's why sometimes people don't like what we say. But we're not going to change it because it's God's authority. Jesus Christ just immediately started giving directions and he said, tell everybody to sit down. What did the disciples do? They learned, listen to Jesus. So they sat everybody down. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They didn't know the extent of what was going to happen either. But they knew this. When Jesus speaks, we listen. When he tells us what to do, that's what we do. So Jesus Christ, he told him, he goes, hey guys, I want you to see what the need is. Christians, we need to see what the need is. Second thing that Jesus told him, he's like, and I also want you to be able to look past your own personal limitations because it's not about you, it's about me. The next, I want you to listen to what I say. Follow my lead, my instructions, my word. Christian, if we ever go against this, our church is done. We have to follow the instructions of God and his authority. And there's one more thing. I want you to turn back to the book of John. Back to the book of John. Back in 6, look at verses 12 through 14. Jesus desires us to see the continuing work or that there is still a need. Man, he, he, he got all the food. He started parting it out. I don't know if he poured that into baskets and it just came pouring out or if he just kept reaching in and pulling it out. That was better than any magic trick you've ever seen. I mean, I'm telling you what, it was, it was the most incredible thing you've ever seen in your life. The food just kept coming and it kept coming and it kept coming. Until there were leftovers. How many leftovers? Twelve basketfuls. 
basketfuls. They were probably not small baskets. They were probably large baskets. Twelve basketfuls left over. Look at John chapter 6, verse 12. When they were filled, that's the people, everybody said, no, I'm good. I don't need any more. He said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. You realize that too, when you look at these, in John, John's the one guy that said, Jesus gave us the instructions <laughs> to gather this up. The rest of the disciples just recorded it and we gathered it up and this is what we had. John says, Jesus told us to. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So this great miracle happens, everybody's fed, and you think, man, this is, this is fantastic, this is great. And then Jesus looks at his disciples, he says, all right, guys, uh, there's still work to do, go gather up the leftovers. Don't you understand that? Jesus still gave them instructions, even though everybody had eaten. It'd be easy to say, hey, whatever's left, take with you, folks, have a good night. Right? I mean, that's kind of what you do, right? You don't want leftovers. What do we do when we, we have big things around here at church? That's one of the worst things we could have is leftovers. Because then we're like, how many refrigerators does it take to put the leftovers in? So you know one of the things that we like to do? Take them with you. Take some, make a plate and take it with you, right? We always try to give away leftovers when we do that. I think we did that after the picnic. We were trying to get people to take hamburgers and hot dogs home. Hey, if you want something to take with you, take some with you. And we're just, we're just giving away. You know why? Because, oh, man, it's work when you've got to gather up the leftovers, isn't it? It's less to clean up. And here, Jesus says, go gather up the leftovers. What's he telling his disciples? You know, we did this great miracle. You saw this great thing of God, but the work's not done. There's still work to do. You know, every time we experience God do something, and we see his hand in it, and we say, wow, God really worked the miracle here. God touched this heart. God touched this life. Guess what? There's still work to do. We're not done. We're not done. For 33 years, God has blessed this church. And we can look back and we can say, man, we had this great day and we had this great event. We had this happen. We had that happen. We had these people saved, that people saved. But I'm here to tell you right now, we're not done. There's still work to do. Jesus Christ said, everybody's full, but there's still work to do, guys. Go grab your baskets. And I love that, that there were 12 baskets full. That number was not a coincidence. That number was to show his disciples who he had just sent on a missions trip who came back and he said, I can do this in each one of you. I can bless every single one of you guys. I can use you to do the exact same thing. Be my basket. Be my basket. Christian, I'm here to tell you, be Jesus Christ's basket. Let him use you to feed others to do wonderful miracles in the hearts and lives. You say, well, what kind of miracles is Jesus going to do through me? I don't know. It may not even be a physical miracle. It would be a spiritual one. Do you, do you realize that every time someone comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's a miracle? Every time somebody's heart and life is given to the Lord, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. It is a supernatural instance. God says, be, let me use you to do that. And so he told the disciples, go gather up the fragments because I want you to learn a lesson. The job isn't over. There's still work to do. Christian, there's still work to do. Our church service is about over. We're going to pray here in just a minute. We're going to have an invitation. Then we're going to walk out these doors and we say, "Woo." That was a good day at church, especially if you were in Jerry's Sunday school class. There's a lot of food. But the work's not done. Our work isn't done until our last breath is taken on this earth. And God wants us to continue to do that work. You know, every disciple, they worked. They were a basket for Jesus Christ until the day that they died. And they died because they were a basket for Jesus Christ. They died martyrs' deaths because they said, we serve 
the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus Christ tried to teach right here. All because of his heart. When he saw the multitude, what was he? Moved with compassion. If we're going to make a difference in this world, if we're going to let Jesus Christ work miracles through us, we need to see through Jesus' eyes and be moved with his compassion. Be moved with the compassion for people that Jesus had and let him work a miracle in us. Bow your heads with me this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed.